Paul Mensa's Wall of Power TV is brought to you in part by Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation, Two Gingers Irish Whiskey, Gray Wolf Lodge, your home away from home in the North Woods, and the Solar Arts Building in Northeast Minneapolis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metza. We have a great show tonight featuring an old friend of mine, Stan Kipper, who's just a phenomenal drummer. Stan got started in the business way back when, right after the Civil War. But <laughs> over least. the years, yeah, over right. the years, Stanley has played with James Taylor, Minnie Ripperton, Joe Walsh, Melanie, the Bee Gees, and more. He also plays timbales and sings on my favorite guilty pleasure song, Thunder Island by Jay Ferguson. We've also been playing together on and off for years. And several years ago, Stan told me about this project he was working on and is debuting next week. From Behind the Sun shines a light on a black family in a red line neighborhood 60 years ago. We also have the co-author of the play, born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, way up there on the edge of the Iron Range, an actor yes, and a playwright mm -hmm. who worked with Stan on this show, and we're happy to have her visiting from Seattle uh, tonight on Wall of Power TV, Laura Drake. Stan, I've got to ask you about when I saw the reading at the Playwright Center, I believe it was in September of, or October, there was this great little bit about the, correct me if I'm wrong, the Clinton Avenue Highway Patrol. <laughs> right? right? Is that going to be in the play? Well, unfortunately, as we, as we were talking about in our rewriting process, the Clinton Avenue Highway Patrol didn't make it into the, into the, uh, into the final version. But it might be the name of our next band together. That's right. So just, That's right. It's, it's not little, done. It's a cute, cute little story. Tell us about it, though. Well, you know, the Clinton Avenue Highway Patrol was a, was a group of us kids back in the day that we used to, you know, of course, we were influenced. We were raised on TV. Yeah. And so uh, the Clinton Avenue Highway Patrol came out of, like, Broderick Crawford, and, Crawford sure. and all this stuff. And so all of us kids had our bikes together, and we would patrol the neighborhood like that. Uh, <laughs> keeping it safe. Yeah, we're keeping it safe. You know, we would ride, ride round and round the block. And uh, make sure everything was cool up on 38th Street, and then we'd ride down to 39th Street, take a look around, and we'd ride over to 3rd Avenue, and we'd hang around. <laughs> we'd roll up and watch the guys make sidewalks and stuff, yeah. you know. Clinton Avenue Highway Patrol, <laughs> making the neighborhood safe. For the future. <laughs> but when Tyler went from being nine years old in the reading, you saw him right. being 14, it became a different thing. And he's also, our 14 year old is also a drummer. Uh, oh, taking drum okay. Drum. That's right. So now, how much material did you have, raw material that you now you had it to, you know, like sculptors start to chip away the stone? How many hours was it? Hours, wow. Days. Hours, many from the reading you yeah, saw to say, now. You're yeah, saying? let's say if you took your whole body of raw material and say, okay, we're going to start here. We're going to have a reading. Would that have been three, four hours worth of stuff that you had to get down to what an hour and a half? Or well, uh, you know, it's it's hard to say because as we as we started rewriting, you know, we just once we got ourselves locked in, we just flowed through what it was and. Um, Hours, hours and hours. We yeah. might spend hours on a paragraph. Right. Oh, you're talking about that, right? You, I mean, I don't know what you, you mean, like, say, well, from just one how reading much, to the was next. It, was it 500 pages that you had to get down to 250 pages? Or oh, that's... yeah, page-wise. You know, we, we started off, I'd say, with like, you know, 80 pages or so. We started pretty low and then right. got quite large and then brought it down and then brought it up again and then tweaked it a little right. bit. I mean, and it takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Did you have any any fights about, no, this has got to stay in, no? We well, yeah. We, we knocked heads yeah, a lot we knocked of heads, you know, we mm -hmm. knocked heads. Oh, knocked heads heavily. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, we, we, it would be like too many words, not enough words. Yeah. Right, so or, we, you we, know, we knocked heads over yeah. lots of things, you know, like she said, we, we uh, spent 
hours on on one paragraph. Yeah. Wow. That type of stuff, you know. I mean, we literally, and we knocked a lot. It was a creative thing. It was it mm -hmm. was it was a soulfully creative thing. Right. You know, because it when you're doing it right, the sun's not out all the time. Right. You know. You know. I mean, especially you know with with the way we are on type A and all this stuff. <laughs> you know, we're very strong about yeah, what yeah. You, you know, know what we believe in, what we believe should be in there. What you know, and then of course when we started working with Gail and Brian. Recently, we sat around one weekend, eight hours Saturday, eight hours Sunday, and you know, it was like, can we switch this around? Can we move this one word here? This person needs to say one more line here, right. you know, and it was very minute, a little, you know. It was like a master class for me. It was like going to, being in a master class. Uh, the whole process, yes, I mean, from all the different people that we've been with and so forth. And then Kim Hines is also another person in the Twin Cities who's a, uh, I met her back in Penumbra days, and yeah. she's a playwright and an actor and a dramaturg, and, and we didn't meet in person, but I sent her the script at one time after the reading, and she gave us some ideas and helped us a bit with the script. And so we've had like four dramaturgs over over time work with us on this, so it's, it was, it's been quite a long process. So how do you... Feel. Now you get, what did you say, 18 people working yeah. on this thing or something? I mean, now with 18 all the text, people in the cast at one I mean, point. You know, I mean, at this time with the text and everything, it's it's gone up to at least, you know, I counted 15 yesterday. Wow. Oh, you mean working with the show right now? Yeah. Talk, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. between 15 So how many are in the cast, first of all? Eight. Eight, eight, eight. people in the cast. And now another 15? Well, you Steve, know, we are, uh, you know, lights, sound, you know. We have images, we're having slides. Props, there's a two big projectors. screens on stage and, right. you know, mm -hmm. uh, to see the actors. And one of the things about it was that, you know, once the cast started doing it and we could hear this stuff come to life, you know, we're talking about rewrites, you know. You know, we were able to see, well, man, that was really cool. And then, you know, that went bogged down, you know. So it wasn't until we actually saw this things uh, being said by people that we could actually go, ah. You know, so each time we had a cast read, we we went back and rewrote our, mm -hmm. our you know, we just changed everything. We really put the screws to it. Right. Another thing I wanted to add about all the people working on it right now is that um, Stan recorded some djembe tracks that there's also going to be some djembe behind some of the scenes. Nice. As well as um, music from the era that's going to be transitioning. So. And the beautiful thing about this play, it's free to the public. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's free. Uh, no reservations are necessary. The, the Whitney Theater is a beautiful theater. It's a thrust stage. Yes, it's it? like a small version of our favorite, the old Guthrie Paul. Oh, Paul. my God, yeah. You know, so, I mean, you can stand on that stage and, you know, you can say, hey, what's happening? And people up in the top of that theater can hear. And it's about 250 seats. Yes, it is. They're available for seats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is, uh, Stan, i got to tell you, is, is a fan of the arts, but is a close personal friend of Stan Kipper's. And you and I have talked about this while well, it's been in progress 50 times, at right? At least, at Over least. Over the last handful of years. At least. You Over know, the phone, early in the morning, late right, at night, talking, on the gig, on the breaks. Mm -hmm. You know, and Paul's got, you know, Paul's got his blue guitar highway going. And I shouted at him from Seattle because I saw a, a thing about Woody Guthrie, right? That it was like the prototype for Paul's blue highway. So we start talking about this and about about the sets and about the the writing and all this stuff. You know, it's been a we have a wonderful. Not only can we rock and roll, but we can push the pin. We yeah. can push the pin. You know, we're doing what we're supposed to do. Well, I have such uh, respect for you as as a musician Back first to you. and a family man and a father. But what does it feel like? Your story and your mom and dad's story, and uh, in a perfect world, well, they're watching it from heaven. I but know. Uh, mm -hmm. from behind the sun, what does it feel like for you now? About a week away. Oh, it's 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 <laughs> incredible. It's uh, it's it's just amazing, you know. For my brother, for my family, for Laura's family, it's it's amazing. You know, the funny thing is, when we were writing this play, I was telling Laura just yesterday, you know, and, all, and I think that this happens to, to a lot of the playwrights. 
I mean, I could hear my parents. Right. You know, they were, they were knocking, waking me up. Right. They would, they would interrupt. Say hey, and they would, you know, they would literally, they would just literally come out right. So I, uh, after Laura and I would put in these eight and nine hour days of, of dealing with these characters all day. I mean, we would take a break when, when we would like take a break for a couple of days just to, to let ourselves clear out. I would miss them. Right. <laughs> it was almost like they were knocking so hard that they, they were there, right? And you know, there's a, the, the, po the poster in yeah. the lobby of the Whitney, there's like these six foot versions of it. Oh. So you walk in, it's like, hey, Obi and Mary, I say, <laughs> say hello every evening. They're, they <laughs> they live. Yeah. They're alive. Laura, what, yeah. um, what was the most enjoyable thing for you about working with uh, my buddy Stan Kipper? I think um, the communication, the ability to um, be able to come up with ideas, uh, shoot them around, agree or disagree, and, 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 and the work ethic of just keep on working and let's get this done. It's like, oh, we got, well, we got to get it done. We, we need to do this, you know. This is, um, it just became clear that this was a story that had to get on the stage. So, and you know, I've just known him as a friend for so long, and, and so to, to, because we had said the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, it's like, let's do something creative together. We're both artists, let's, let's try to do, and then also I was a public school teacher for 15, last 15 years, and, and he came out to the schools that I taught at and did drumming workshops. We put a show together about bullying with drumming and spoken word, and I so. I remember that. Yeah, so it was like, let, you know, let's, let's do something. And the writing came in, and, and, um, and we got some ideas for some other new things coming up. And so it's just been a, it's like t this late in life for something like this to happen. It's, it's like, wow, this it's is great. It's never too late. <laughs> it's never too no, it's late. Wonderful. It's, too late. it's been it's a wonderful thing. Laura, i got to ask you, I have to imagine at some point when mommy or daddy is bringing their kid to one of your classes, whether it's one of your camps or to school, do they ever do a double take and go, God, she looks like that woman I saw on Star Trek? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had one person, when that came on TV, ask me if it was me because they said they recognized my eyes, which is <laughs> all you see anyway. And I want to give a shout out to my wonderful daughter, Gemma Clark, yes. who lives in Chicago. And she, she she's an actor and a comedian. Hi, Gemma. Right, and she's she's Hi, got Gemma. And uh -huh. she she has an Instagram post called Sketch Us Out. Yes. She and another gal do comedy, and they are doing four Friday nights in April at eight o'clock at Second City in Fant Chicago. Wow. Stan They're Kipper, still... what was it like working with this Laura Drake, this phenomenal artist who was born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota? <laughs> Home of Judy Garland. Home of Judy Garland. Yeah. I have a brick in the yellow brick road. And well, and they found the ruby slippers. Yes, they found yeah. I know, it's so good. Fantastic. <laughs> Working with Laura was really good. We, uh, we uh, had a natural uh, creative energy. Um, you know, her theater background um, made it, you, you know, we have a lot of things in common anyway. But uh, the art side of it was really fun. Uh, she gave me a ton of encouragement. Uh, she was the one that suggested that I start writing the play. You know, uh, without her suggestions and all the rest, there wouldn't be, um, there wouldn't be from behind the sun. You know, so uh, she's very focused, very, very astute editor, and um, really kept me on the, on the path in a way that was a very disciplined approach you know we um, have blaze we spend a lot of time together a lot of, and we like I said before we creatively knock heads and we can still uh, eat well you're dinner. supposed to yeah right? yeah. yeah we're yeah. supposed to knock yeah. right and yeah. so yeah. it's been a wonderful experience I feel supported protected and challenged and all that wonderful stuff about mm -hmm. working with her I want to say first of all thank you both for sharing Time on Wall of Power TV. Oh, Paul, thank, thank you, you Paul. for having us, man. Thank and you. and you know, I've been with you all along the way, brother. Oh, I Stan, know. Right? I know. We're not done yet either. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of road to travel. Yes, yet. we do. But what I love about what I know now after this conversation, 
You're from Grand Rapids, Minnesota. <laughs> Stanley, this play takes place in 1956 in South Minneapolis. The idea for the play came from the bar at Nye's. Yes, it did. From a fellow postal worker who used to work with your dad, Obi. I'm imagining that Mikey was behind the bar mixing teenies back then. He was. I don't know if the, I know you like to set up early. I don't know if it was early enough because one of the Catholic priests that used to come down before confession, there was kind of a nice little secret about nice. He'd go and get his whiskey up his coffee cup before he'd go up to do confessions every morning. <laughs> nice. Well, there you go. At the church that my great-grandfather helped build, I might add. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, and then, so, you've known each other for, for years. You come back, you work at the Playwright Center. You have the history at the Penumbra with the great Lou Bellamy, the Bellamy family, and the great August Wilson. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were one of the most revered musicians in town. And to watch this thing develop from what I've seen and now to hear the story, I want to give a shout out to the great artistic community that we have in Minnesota, and yes. especially the Twin Cities. That's right, that's right. This is music, this is art, this is playwrights, this is acting. And then, let's add the technical directors, and, and uh, the directors, and the people right. that help you write the, the play, producers. and the, pe the, uh, the people that help you put it on. It's just phenomenal. Plus, you know, it's, a, it's the Midwest, you know. It's uh, our perspective and our point of view um, gives us insight into into each other, into each other's cultures in a lot of cities and a lot of uh, geographical areas in the United States don't have. Yeah, because really, for the most part, we do all get along here, right? <laughs> for, for the, the most, most part. part. <laughs> for the most part. And, you know, this play could play very well in Seattle, too, because yeah. there's a lot of similarities between the two cities, and I'm hoping that uh, we're hoping that a theater here, a professional theater here, will pick it up because this is a college production. We're hoping that a professional theater will pick it up. We've invited many people to come and that we can take it then from here to Seattle and other cities, to Chicago and other places as well to let it play there. And We've got the Ritz Theater right up the street. That's right. Mm -hmm. The Ritz right over there. Jack Ruler, are you watching and yeah. listening? We've talked to Jack. Yeah, It'd be great to see you a lot. Oh, could, it could go anywhere. The show's going to go all around the country. I have a great feeling about it. I want to wish you guys the absolute best. I'm very excited to see this show. Oh, thank you, and Paul. Bless you both for getting it together. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much thank for you having us. Oh, thank you so much you. for having us. I hope you enjoyed uh, this show on Wall of Power TV. It's, I know I'm doing the right thing by doing what I do to be able to connect with artists like this and bring them on, share their stories and their work with you. Hi, this is Paul Metza. Welcome to Wall of Power TV. We continue our series on the legacy and the music of the great Willie Murphy. The man sitting next to me is a phenomenal musician himself. Stan Kipper has played with everyone from James Taylor, Joe Walsh, Melanie, the Bee Gees, Minnie Ripperton, Jay Ferguson, and many others. He's helmed a band in town for over 15 years called the New Primitives, and way before that was in a legendary band called Gypsy. Stan is an amazing percussionist, singer, band leader, and songwriter. And I want to ask him a little bit about the great Willie Murphy. What kind of a loss, Stan, do you think it is losing Willie Murphy, the heart and soul of the Minneapolis music scene? Well, it's, uh, it's hard to explain. I mean, to me, Willie was, Willie was like Prince in... in uh, in terms of what his loss meant for the Minneapolis music scene. People have to realize that Willie uh, was a deep soul warrior from way back in the day. I remember seeing Willie, you know, the only white boy, but the only with some of the, the coolest black bands that ever come up out of this town. Right. Willie with the Val Dons and with Dave Brady and the Stars, and, you know, he was, he was something else. And this else. was back in a day when... when 
integrated bands were rare. Oh yes, they were rare. Not only were they rare, and people, people, uh, you know, you had to be careful where you went and how you rolled. You know, uh, Willie, um, Willie didn't see color, and uh, he was an astute student of the music. His knowledge of what was happening was unparalleled. I mean, come on, man. Willie was something else. I mean, um... And playing, you know, go back, and he was playing bass in those black bands. That's right. You know what I mean? Yes, he was. And I can, the thing was, man, I can remember uh, way, way, way back in the day, I played, you know, my uh, my childhood band, the Marauders, the Marvelous Marauders. <laughs> you know, we, uh... Did you have capes? Oh, man, we didn't have capes. We might, we should have had capes. Yeah. You know, we had like, you know, such funny stories. We were wearing matching tuxedo jackets and all this stuff. Sure. And, uh, you know, we were like a show band. Yeah. So funny. So funny. And speaking of Minnie Riberton, the first time I saw Minnie Riberton, we, we were in the Marauders, right? And we had to play this show in the middle of the afternoon outside of Chicago. And, you know, Shadows and Night were on this sure. show. Gloria. Uh, 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 a Rotary Connection Minnie's sure. band, right? And, and oh, was that Minnie's band? Rotary yes, Connection. and then okay. a hawk with with uh, uh, Banger Flying Circus and all this stuff, right? The people I ended up playing with it when we all were in Los Angeles. But anyway, we uh, showed up with the Marauders, and you know we couldn't figure out why we couldn't get close to the show, and we were trying to figure out what was going. There were so many kids trying to go to this show that we were almost late getting there. So we get to this show and we walk into the backstage and it was our first glimpse of full-blown hippies. Right. You know, here's Minnie with this big old afro, this beautiful purple crust. I can still remember what the girl was wearing. Wow. Everybody was out there. Everybody was so cooled out. And so we, and here we were in we our were tuxedos <laughs> from the Midwest. <laughs> Look like we just rolled ro ro up the Look at me. Look like we rolled up by the corn, right? And then we were standing the corn out of your hair. <laughs> you know, in these black tuxedos with these brown <laughs> shoes and shit. <laughs> it was too much. That last gig with that, those outfits. You know, but man, <laughs> that's fantastic. Know, it was slipped back to Minneapolis, right? And uh, at some point, we uh, <laughs> we had this house, 122 Virginia Street, which with a 25 room mansion over by Summit Avenue, right? So we all moved into For this. For 200 bucks a month or yeah, something, Yeah, it was $111 right? a month. Wow. And we got it from Andy Howell, who was from White Bear, and Willie was from White Bear. Yeah. So was Doug Maynard, who was also yeah. in the band, right? Some deep soul warriors. I kept, I kept trying to figure out why the White Bear Lake, could have, you know, no disrespect and no color and stuff, but the brothers coming out of White Bear Lake <laughs> right. could throw down, right? Yeah. I mean, and they, they was, they were some funky boys, they could play. One day we're playing, and Willie has the bees going, and he's playing bass, right? And everybody used to come over to our house to jam. And I didn't really, me, me and Willie didn't really know each other that mm -hmm. well, right? But he came over one day, and uh, he picked up his guitar, because he was playing bass the whole time. And I said to him, you know, uh, Dick Hebler was playing bass at the time, and Dick could really thump, and I think Willie Weeks was there as well. Right. And so we started playing, and Willie, you know, how's he going to pick up with Willie Weeks in the room? Right. Who's he, playing with Clapton now? Yeah. Uh, but with him thumping bass, right, Willie was like, okay. Right. <laughs> right? Willie was respectful, you know. Yeah. He went over and picked up the guitar. And he started playing this guitar, and I gotta tell you guys, we played all night long. Wow. And I kept watching Willie rediscover his guitar chops. It, right. it was like he was so bad, and he didn't put this thing down, right? He just was sm And I was watching him, right? Because he was playing like some of the baddest boys and playing stuff that none of, none of us had ever really heard. Willie come with that Chicago stuff, right. 
you know, and, and, and just straight into the amp with no with no shit on boys, you hear me? Right. Straight into a fender amp. He was playing a he was playing a stratocaster. Straight into the amp. And he started plucking them strings like you know, he was like Curtis Mayfield one oh. minute, right? And then he was like muddy the next. Right. And then he was like <sighs> You know, then he was like Chuck Berry the next. Right. And then he was like pure Willie, right? He even played slide guitar, you know, through, it was, throughout the course of the night, it was like watching him write a book. Wow. It was indelibly stamped on, on me. And me and Willie became super, super, super tight from that moment on. I never played with the, any of his bands. And every now and then I would go sit in with him. Uh, but we had, there was a connection behind that night that we never, ever, ever lost. That's a beautiful story, Stan. Oh, he was something else. And uh, to see the look on his face and the pure enjoyment to watch him rediscover this guitar. Hmm. And I think, you know, he went on to whip guitar after that. Yeah. Right, Paul? Sure. Yeah. That became his rig after that, right? Yeah, he moved later away on. from that bass, right? And he started playing that guitar exclusively. Later in the bees. When I remember watching him, he would uh, he he'd be playing bass, and I loved the bees with Willie on the bass. Yeah, he but, could thump too. He could that boy. Uh, he was like Jamie Jamerson. Yeah, and James he was, Jamerson. He was. Yeah. And then, but Speaking then Demko, of... Joey Demko, would play the bass, and then Willie would play guitar, and um, still that mad bad mojo that was Willie and the bees. You know that band. Like, I, I wrote something about Willie. I said, the, that band of outlaws and renegades and soul, soul survivors, man, they came fully formed out of a Sam Peckinpah fever dream. They were something else. And, you know, the thing was, y'all got to remember, back in the day, now, an interracial band like that, doing what they were doing, look how they looked, and bringing that kind of music with that attitude, uh, it was a crying shame that... Uh, there wasn't a record company or anything like that around here who knew what to do with the bees. Right. And there was a lot of bands in the area like that, you know. And I think as we, as young kids, that was one of the, one of the things that made us all, you know, when when our folks took us to California and all this stuff. That was one of the things that just changed it all for us, right? Because we just saw the chance to make livings and pay mortgages and stuff, which something was really hard to do. Uh, back in the day, and Willie was so original, the Bees were so original, and that band was molded. I See, we were talking about Willie and the Bees after all this time. Homeboy's Angel-Headed Hipsters was a hell of a band. Right. I mean, I don't know if you all heard, but Willie knew how to make re records. Willie was something else. And not only that, uh, when I last saw Bonnie when she was here, yeah. me, me and you were together. Yeah. <laughs> we were there. We were Paul, right? Hell yeah. Bobby but Mandel. anyway, B Bonnie said, you know, really, because she heard you when you wasn't feeling good, but boy, she was still talking about that funky record they made out there yeah. on, on Excelsior on the Big Island. Enchanted Island. Enchanted Big Island. <laughs> you hear what I'm talking about? And Willie was a producer for that. I mean, uh, do yourself a favor and go back to, well, do yourself a favor and go listen to any Willie shit. Yeah. But go back and listen to what he did with Bonnie back in the day uh, with the remote recordings and all this obscure stuff. I mean, Homeboy knew how to make it work. You know, he would, with what he had, he would put on the baddest stuff that was at his disposal. And he called on all of his brothers playing with him to come with him and join him, right? right. It was a ride that they went on. Uh, Willie was an eccentric, wonderful guy, but he was uh, playing for keeps and playing it for real. Stanley Kipper, thanks so much for sharing that memory, uh, Willie Murphy. Oh, thank you so much for giving me the chance to do it, brother Paul. I'll see you on the bandstand soon, brother. You got it. Stanley Kipper. The New Primitives, every Tuesday night at Shaw's 16th Uni University. In Northeast Minneapolis, I'm there with Willie Walker on Thursday nights at 5. Check my brothers out. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Go Stanley. get them, man. I'm your host, Paul Metza. See you next weekend. We'll save your seat.